strike of a light pole. I just air it out and leave with the mic broke. Your micro, I'm hard body like Tyco. Heavy metal Chevys with nitro. Addicted to the vapors of paper. Hypnotic to the thirst. I'm pulling off criminal capers. I know the cocaine crackery stinks, but that's what it is. Surrounded by the khakis and mints. We move. All right, so welcome back to Developer Commentary. My name is Mike Stout. I'm Tony Garcia. And our guest today is... Moo Yu. Indeed. It sounded like I edited that in, but that was just him. <laughs> yeah, it just sounded like that. Sorry. So uh, well, while we were in between recordings, we were, we were like, Moo, what did you actually do? And it turns out he did The Phoenix and Annihilation Nation. So uh, we should probably cover those things before we move on to uh, Tyrannosis. Cool. So yeah, I mean, Starship Phoenix was sort of... I got handed it from Tim, who was uh, there at the time, and he was handling it, and then he took it over. This transport was actually the biggest help. Can you run around at all in the transport? Uh, yeah. Okay. The, the main problem, like, I'd say at least 20% of the bugs I had on Starship Phoenix were people escaping out of that transport by just, like, button mashing and trying to jump out those backsides when opening Are you for real? Like, that was, that was the biggest thing? Seriously. So, like, when you start, we lock you down, and then... Oh, you can't jump anymore. Yeah. Okay. I just remember I spent so much time on it, and at the end, I, f I felt like we almost locked you down completely, and it was just like all my effort just gone out the window. Yeah, you can run around, but you can't jump. Okay. That's, and yeah, that kind of that kind of rings true with what I remember. That's kind but of... Yeah, uh, just like, that's basically what we do with the taxis, too, so they're yeah. probably for the same reason. Yeah, but, you know, it's it wasn't a whole lot to do. There was, like, you know, the little VR arena stuff. There were these guys walking around... Um, which was, you know, it's one of my first tasks ever programming in a video game. So it's just like having these guys walk around and make sure they're always in step. Like you can still get in front of them and they'll try and catch up with each other and all that kind of stuff. Um, they'll both kind of stop and then try to sync up later once you're not in their way. Um, and that kind of stuff. But yeah, it's kind of this weird, um, yeah, weird little hub, hub level and just... Little bits and pieces. Now, weren't there like six or eight copies of this level? Plus, there's one where you come in and fight ninjas? Yeah, there's the ninja one. I didn't do that version of it. And then there's like the space combat version and all these. Yeah, it's it's a big level that you come back to over and over. But there's actually not a whole lot going on. And then the trophy rooms in here. I think this was Greg. Yeah, I think so. Um, and I think there's a secret if you hit this with a wrench. Yeah, there we go. I don't think it's if you hit it with the wrench. I think we so many people hit it with the wrench that we had to put a message on there that that was saying that's not the secret. Oh. Because like in focus test, people any door that doesn't open, they'll just keep hitting it with the wrench <laughs> over and over <laughs> till the end of time. So we had a a, a a commenter mention that he's he was so tired of hearing how uh, the the focus testers ruined it for everyone. And I think we're kind of giving a, uh, uh, maybe an, a skewed view of what the, the, the user testing actually gives us. It's not that the focus testers are stupid most of the time. It's that what we're doing is not communicating very well. And so when we see a lot of people failing on it, it means that we need to communicate better. Wait, what was his complaint? That, we're, that we dumbed down the game because of focus testers? Was that what he was saying? Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was that uh, uh, we dumbed down the game or cut a lot of features because this, the, the focus testers couldn't get it. And I, I think that's sort of a fair interpretation based on what we've been saying, but that's not really how, how it works, right? Like what, what happens is we did it wrong and we have, to, we, we have to do it right. And sometimes doing it right is so much work that we can't afford to do it. Uh, so we have to cut the feature. It's not that uh, someone is too stupid to do it. It's that we just we, we can't we can't spend the time to do it right. Exactly. I mean, I think with the focus testing, the challenge is you know the fun, challenging part of gameplay is when you understand all the rules and you're trying to figure out how to play the rules off each other and so on and so forth. Right. The not fun part is when you have no idea what's going on, and that's the main thing we we're trying to find out in focus testing. Yeah, because if you can't understand what questions the game is asking you, it's not really a game. It's just kind of an exercise in frustration. Uh, so, yeah, uh, that was kind of a sidetrack. Uh, was there anywhere else we were going with that, or, or are we going to go to uh, Annihilation Nation now? Um, actually, go drop in the... Was that the VR testing? Oh, the VR testing, okay. I th was that what you were just at? Uh, the VR testing is in here. 
Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh, no, sorry, no, the, the weapon testing. Like, the one of the big things that they were pushing with me is that you should be able to try every weapon before you buy it. So we made, like, the, the mini arena over... I thought it was over there, but I, I can't think, remember. I think this is it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, so that you could basically um, try any weapon you wanted before you bought it. Is that what this is? This is the... This, oh, you know what? This might just be an arena challenge. I think there's arena challenges, but I think if you go to that vendor over in the other room, you can actually try weapons before you buy them. Um, um, all right, let me, which, let me go try that. I believe you're which right. If, yeah, uh, which, which I've, if I remember was um, produced my favorite bug of all time. <laughs> um, the golden and, and, shower? And by, by, no, not by favorite bug of all time. I mean favorite written bug of all time. And that it allowed me to be a total fucking asshole. Um, <laughs> tier, tier guys is spelled wrong in the config file. That that was second. This one was um, step one: play a VR challenge and test out a weapon. Um, they're not here. Oh yeah, it's right there on the. It's on the portrait of the weapon. It says. Oh okay. Uh, test weapon. Yeah. Uh, step two was collect bolts. Uh, step three was finish the challenge and exit. And then the result was, you still have the vol bolts from the VR challenge, even though it was virtual reality. <laughs> was, that, um, was that when you I, started I, the bug? Uh, the, the really, really big, really long bug? Uh, about no, 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 no. This was the time where uh, someone, I won't name them, had been hired as a designer at another studio and sort of... Or thought they, they sort of like got stronger design chops than, uh, than they did. And my comment back in the bug was... Uh, made a mistake <laughs> i think we're gonna have to bleep out that name but i think uh, the studio name but i think that's that's not bad that's okay the studio uh, doesn't exist anymore tony uh, well all right we'll, we'll do whatever <laughs> but that's pretty good yeah i got a stern talking to after that <laughs> so there's actually something that was reminded to me when we went into the vr challenge that i think i, I want to go over with Moo really quick do you and want me to go back to the vr no challenge? no no, no. We, we i just okay. we can just discuss it uh while we transition to the next thing, we can just discuss it. Um, okay. We mentioned in in our level two episode about how Moo got very mad at me for hacking in the crate spawner on like month two of development <laughs> in Ratchet and Clank. Yeah. And uh, we actually had a comment in the YouTube video, which was strongly on my side, which was how dare Moo get angry at you for just wanting to isolate your special case code from the rest of his code why would he be so mad about that and that is my opinion on the whole thing but moo actually felt so very strongly that that was such a bad thing to do and i want you to have a chance to defend yourself about why that is actually a horrible practice and why you were right to actually get very upset at me for hacking in if so, level equal equals two on like month two this this smells like drama this is. I'm going to give a rebuttal, and it's going to connect in with Annihilation Nation. Um, and so when I started, the Annihilation Nation was the second thing I was assigned. And one of the first bugs that I had in Annihilation Nation was that if you leave Ratchet long enough, he starts shivering. And, you know, it's a, it's a plenty warm level, everything's fine, and he just starts shivering. <laughs> and so I had to search through the code and find out what's going on. And I discovered that apparently level 7 in Ratchet and Clank 2 was an ice level. <laughs> and so somebody had put in the code, if level equals 7, Ratchet's idle animation becomes shiver. <laughs> and that's why I think putting level numbers in code is bullshit. So you think across the board it's a bad practice? Yeah, pretty much. I think you should add a, you know, add a PVAR, as they were called back then, a checkbox that's like, behave differently for this one object. So it wasn't that you were mad that he had hacked your code. It was that you thought he hacked your code the wrong way. Yeah, exactly. Because I think there were other crate spawners in that level that were broken because of that code. I don't think that's true. I think you're just making stuff up now. I'm pretty sure that was the case, that I ran into it because I had to fix another bug because crate spawners were being retarded that's elsewhere ridiculous. in the That's ridiculous. There's no way that that's true. That never happened. <laughs> well, yes, my rebuttal is, yeah, Shiver Animation, I, An Annihilation Nation. What the hell was going that's on? That's pretty good. I don't remember. I didn't remember that. But yeah, I guess that's. I guess because I think we didn't reset the code base on when we went from game to game. Like we didn't have a base code base that we reverted back to. We just right. took everything and just moved on to the next project. So that kind of stuff sort of lingered, and there was plenty of that stuff that was you know even by deadlocked. 
a lot of that stuff was just yeah. in there and it was just lingering around yeah loads and loads of like level levels hard coded and moby numbers hard coded and all that kind of stuff actually i want to just uh, go and get on one more tangent uh, yeah go ahead because i know we're an annihilation nation but i think mu has a very very good perspective about about this that i don't think we're going to get elsewhere so you were on ratchet and clank 3 and ratchet and clank deadlocked and you were basically yep. You inherited all the worst parts about working with a long, <laughs> long a code base that had been there for a long period of time. Because you weren't even there to write originally. You were just inheriting yeah. all these things. And most of the people that had been there that had written it originally were long gone. And we couldn't yeah. even go to them anymore. So, I mean, that was pre that's pretty much the worst case scenario for dealing with that kind of code base. But uh, what I think a lot of people don't know is that you were... Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the lead on Ratchet and Clank Future, right? The lead programmer. Yep. And you had the opportunity to start fresh. And so yep. what was that sort of transition like to re to actually have a blank slate on Ratchet and Clank? Like, was that freeing or was that terrifying or what? Yeah, on one hand, it was incredible to just like not have all these horrible hacks, not have everything written in this crazy way. I mean, one of the problems with the older code base was that everything was custom coded. Like, you know, the, the, the amount of copy and pasting and, you know, no shared code and so on and so forth. So sort of to get back to like core principles and, you know, like be able to reuse code and have smaller teams and that kind of stuff was awesome. But the downside was, especially because the PS2 stuff was all written frame based. So all, you know, movements we did were like, you know, increment one frame of movement. Like the assumption was we would run at 60 no matter what. We didn't care about, you know, time steps. And on the PS3, we decided, no, we actually need to adjust for different frame rates and so on and so forth. So real, real quick, I, I'm sorry, let me, let me bust in. So when you're, when you're talking about uh, frame-based versus time-based, can you give the, the, the viewers sort of a little oh, back yeah. what about that what is? So yeah, basically, if something's frame-based, you can put something like every frame move one meter, you know, or like move 0.3 meters or something like that. Or if it's time-based, you have to say like, well, the velocity is going to be like, four meters per second, so multiply, you know, the velocity by time to figure out how, to, how much to move forward. And so all your code has to work in, you know, any frame rate that you give it. Where you make it, when you write it frame-based, if you're not running at 60, you're just hosed. Like, you're, it's just done. Right, so you're, you're talking about the difference between using a delta versus a fixed, a fixed uh, exactly. value. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Yeah. So, so because of that, like, getting things to feel exactly the, the same way, you couldn't really rewrite or you couldn't just copy and paste from the PS2 code base and port it over. You had to kind of rewrite everything. So was in the number of bugs, oh, the number of bugs that were sort of, this doesn't feel exactly like it did on the PS2 were numerous. Was that actually <laughs> a big issue for you guys, that trying to replicate, like exactly how it how it felt in the old code base? Oh, absolutely. Like one of the you know the function we lived and died by on the PS2 was organic delt. Yes. Um, and that's, you know, a four or five line function if you write it frame based. But if you write it uh, time step based, it's a clusterfuck. Like, I think, you know. What's an organic delta? So it's it's a, a movement with uh, linear acceleration and linear deceleration. And just so you sort of get like, you know, nice acceleration up to top speed and then like, nice deceleration back down to your target. Um, so you sort of like speed up and slow down and it feels really nice. And I think Pete wrote the, the version for the PS3 code base. And it was something like, you know, 150 lines or something like that. Oh Way more than the six than it was on the PS2. Uh, oh, we just missed uh, something I did that you guys sort of mentioned earlier. But when uh, we try to use the code for the physics code for the plasma whip. Yes. Right. Uh, and it didn't work out. And if you saw there, Helen had a plasma whip. And that's where it ended up. So did you have? Were you the one in charge of porting that over and making it work? And yeah. So so basically, uh, we already had it. These a, guys have whips too. Yeah. They, they they were really keen on using that code. Uh, it was sort of the the hose code that they ended up using for the the coolant packs on the back of the resistance guys. Um, but yeah, it was it was tough to get right because you know you had to make sure like the animation keyframes like pulled it along in a natural way and all that kind of stuff. And when you leave stuff up to physics, it's sort of it's hard to get the exact desired effect that you want. Right. For sure. I and mean, this was definitely the sort of environment for those kind of for that particular object because it's all a lot of flat ground collision. There's exactly. not a lot of stuff for Yeah, you don't have on. to worry about you know like it bouncing over stuff. The other thing I, I really love about the the enemies I had to program for this, like if you notice the last batch of guys, they're all on wheels, um, because foot sliding was obviously such a big issue and such a huge time. <laughs> I mean, here's a wave of all guys, no feet. 
um, <laughs> which was awesome. And then the, the test VR arena was also all balls. So like they didn't even have to turn their wheels correctly. It was just you know floating on balls. Don't worry about foot sliding. <laughs> so yeah, that's uh, that's it's you know a, a big part of the ratchet art style is these guys floating on the single wheels, and a lot of that is just because we didn't want to deal with foot sliding bugs. Yeah, they they, they took far more of our time than they probably should have. I remember when that that three day bender that Tony went on. Um, at least. I'd say at least 40 of those bugs out of the 300 were foot sliding bugs. Yeah, and for maybe, sure. and maybe, uh, maybe another 40 were pathfinding issues. Yeah, uh, because we didn't we didn't have any kind of pathfinding or AI system or anything like that. It was all just like, uh, actually, Tony, you explained to me how how uh, how you went about having the AI approach Ratchet, and it was kind of interesting. Why don't you? Uh, well, I want to talk more. I, w I just want to talk about a lot of annihilation nation while we're here because I okay. think I think there's a lot going on here. In that, I just want to get your perspective, Moo. In that, I think a lot of people believe, and I think correctly, that I think the arenas were one of the best things we did in Ratchet Clank Two. I think they were just an amazing success across the board. Yeah. So, what was the approach that you guys had to take going into this one in terms of like you know what what were we dropping, what were we accentuating, like where was the focus? for you guys when you were making these? Yeah, I think the, the main focus was just sort of to like get the same kind of feel, you know, like making sure that things could escalate properly. So, you know, you sort of start simple and you start adding hazards, start adding more complicated waves of enemies and all that kind of stuff. Um, and yeah, it was, you know, I, I think it was trying to keep all the best parts of it and trying to make sure everything stayed focused um, and really simple and, you know, just made sure it escalated properly and felt about right. Um, yeah, I, I think it was much more trying to 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 get all the same kind of feels with different elements, um, rather than you know trying to change too much because it was really great in the for, in Wreck and Clank too. Mm -hmm. Also, really expensive, right? Uh, in terms of resources, it, it takes to like this took a lot of your time. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, getting all the different waves, uh, the number of enemies, all the bosses, getting every, all, all these kinds of transitions working right, you know, in between waves and that kind of stuff. Um, as well as like the progression, the unlocking, and shockingly, all the UI involved was just massive. Well, I imagine, uh, um, especially the way you work, I imagine you didn't pilfer too much from the old code base. You, you, you're the type of person who likes to do things your own way, right? So you probably didn't yep. inherit too much from you know, what was there before. Yeah, I think pretty much every single element of this is completely, was completely rewritten from scratch. Um, just trying to make it feel just like the old one. Um, I, I guess the, old, the hard part is just, you know, trying to take over a huge amount of someone's code is always a huge challenge, especially if you're brand new to the industry and brand new to the code base. Mm -hmm. um, I think if I was more experienced, I, if I were to do it nowadays, I probably would have taken a lot more. Um, but yeah, back then, the, the attitude was just rewrite everything to be exactly how you want it. Right, but at the same time, exactly how you want it, but trying to mimic the old code as much as possible. It's a exactly. it's a weird yeah, to get the, it's a weird right position deal. to be in because I know there's like you know there's a lot of minor things like just getting the guys running out of those pods. There, there are a lot of things come on to that, like getting them like they get caught up running at the edges and things like that. Yep. And I you know Max yeah. spent a lot of time in Ratchet and Clank two fixing those problems in his system, and then you know you're starting to run into those problems again. And having to fix them over again in in your new way, it's you know it 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 can be seen as sort of a lost bit of time. Where you're like, we've and, already solved this yeah. once, and now you're doing it again. We're and Max had, the exact same problems. Max had moved on to resistance too at that point, so uh, yep. uh, he wasn't really around and, and able to help fix those things. Yeah, I mean, he wasn't around to like literally fix the code, but he was definitely around to like give advice and say like, when I ran into a problem, I could always drop by and be like, "How did you solve this last time?" And he would say, "Oh, you know, look at this code over here. This is the solution." And I'd say, oh, "Okay, you know, like as a, at a high level, like one of the biggest problems with the arenas is guys somehow like vanishing and the arena level just being like being in an empty arena, it not registering that you're done because you know someone like wandered out the arena or when you hit one of them, it flew out or so on and so forth." Um, so yeah, he sort of helped me like you know jump to the right conclusions on how to solve those kinds of problems. How did you solve that kind of problem? Uh, we just put like a big uh, a pill around the arena, and anything outside the pill just died. <laughs> so if anything ever escaped, we just killed it. Elegant. Yep. Uh, did I just lose? So did you do you did the boss fights in here as well, right? 
Yeah, I did the boss fights. I don't. I think Jared did most of these platforming sections, though. The ones that are like a platforming section and like a boss fight and that kind of stuff. I think Jared did most of the platform stuff. So these were, I guess, your first boss fights that you ever ever did. Um, the first boss fight was in another level, but yeah, this was sort of like the second and third boss fights I'd ever done. How did which you? One, which one was your first one? Uh, the the spaceship thing, Mabob. I don't know what it was called. <laughs> okay, fair enough. So, um, but yeah, we haven't gotten to that yet. So, how did you approach sort of that sort of? I mean, boss fights are difficult. Like boss fights are really yeah. hard to do. Like, how did you, how did you go in and just be like? Because I mean, you know, first year making games, and now you have to do boss fights. Like that's yeah. Uh, I mean, it was crazy. I mean, even especially for the the other boss fight I did, it was the third Moby I implemented. Um, so it was kind of crazy. But on this one, I was working with Colin, uh, and he sort of had you know like pretty detailed design docs on what he had in mind. Um, and, you know, a lot of stuff doesn't transfer very well from paper into implementation, but just like sort of sitting with him, going through all the details, just figuring out what does and doesn't work. Um, but yeah, it's just sort of making sure that, that you know, everything feels right and escalates right. And then that, as, as you guys always mention, like that you feel powerful. Like there's so many of these attacks on these boss fights that are all about making something look really threatening, but not being threatening at all. Mm -hmm. Like the um, uh, like a, mortar attacks, right? The exactly. The mortar attack is like the perfect example of that, where you have like a billion reticles, but because you're warned about them and have so much time to get out of the way, like you're not ever really in danger. You just have to not stand still. Um, but you really do feel like you're being a badass and avoiding, you know, a hundred missiles or so on or whatever it is. Sweet. So, um, I guess did you? I, we use that that missile reticle thing a lot of places. Was w did you do it first on this boss, and was I stealing no, that kind no, of stuff Car from you? Or uh, Carl uh, Carl Glaive came up with that originally for I can't remember what it was for. I think we had an enemy that been... did it, but I don't recall. Yeah. Like oh, I remember. It was like the giant mech guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was got the he was like oh, built the... in two parts and yep. yeah, yeah, floating yeah. robot torso or a different guy. Oh no, no, this no, guy no, no, was a different walking one. around and yeah, he had missile cannons and. He, yeah. He's in the Doctor Nefarious fight as well. Yeah, he was. He came first. Yeah, that's where we sort of got that that attack from. Why don't you do the championship out, Mike? Let's look at let's look at Moo's hard work at boss fights. <laughs> okay, I uh, I well, I just I did the championship out and I think I lost it, so I didn't want to do it again. Have we unlocked uh, the second boss? Uh, I think if we do a couple more of these, we can get to the second. I don't even recall the second okay. boss. What's the second boss here? The the scorpion guy, scorpion tank thing. I think I think you have to play other levels to unlock that. Oh, like that you have to come back to Annihilation Nation later in the storyline. Yeah, because we only had one arena in this one, so we unlocked a bunch of challenges later. Yeah, yeah. Because so I think this this challenge is just more more of the same rather than you know like big crazy new. I think enemies. I think the the actually uh, so you worked on Dax, right? I think the yep. the next Annihilation Nation comes right after Dax. Be I think that's right, yeah. Because you uh, you come here to get the prize from Courtney Gears so that you can ask her why she's sponsoring Dr. Nefarious or whatever. Got it. Wow, way to spoil the story, though, Mike. That I was know. great of you. Yeah. You guys, yeah, you guys have to get me back when you guys go to that part because it has the only texture that I drew that stayed in the game. <laughs> <laughs> For the why boss would... fight, you mean? Yeah. I remember... This is something I might be misremembering, but that helix effect on the on the robots, like wasn't there a lot of pushback to not have that helix effect? Like, I remember there being some sort of fight over that. Yeah. So the problem was originally that I didn't know how to do any effects, and I kept trying all kinds of different stuff. And the only thing that I could do that looked really cool was helixes, <laughs> and so I started putting them everywhere. Um, and I think that was sort of the problem is that like. Everything sort of, I mean, this is this wasn't a proper helix. It's just a texture that kind of looks like right. it. But when I was doing, like, the VR training swing shot stuff, like, everything was a helix with, you know, subtractive blending because it's just, like, the only tools I kind of knew. Um, like, for example, when the crates pop up, they have a helix around them to, so like, squish them in and pop them. Like, basically everything I did at the beginning had a helix in it. And I guess people pulled you aside and said, hey, maybe you need to cut back. Yeah, may, maybe less helixes. Well, it's kind of they're, like they're... people pulled you aside and told you to stop doing um, pink effects. Uh, pink effects, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but oh, then shit, we Tony. had the court. But then we had the Courtney Gears level, which was all pink, and that's okay. 
apparently. Yeah, but that, it was mainly because it was me is why it was okay. Oh, I see. When it when it's you, you can't do it. But. Hmm. <laughs> So, uh, uh, I just got an Inferno crate in a timed level, or in a timed round, and uh, the Inferno crate almost screwed me out of the beating that round. Oh. That's not nice. Hey. Why, why would you do something like that? <laughs> I didn't do something like that. Somebody put that in there, put it in the spawner. Mm, whoever did this level, it's probably their fault. Probably a designer. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, probably a designer. So, I think the one nice thing about arenas versus um, the battlefields was instead of having to, like, set up a bunch of blocks, like, all of it was just, I think, a big, like, table in code. And basically, all they'd have to say is be like, oh, this is, you know, my new Excel spreadsheet. Please put this in, rather than spending weeks and weeks of trying to, like, rig up enemies and so on and so forth. That's it. Progress. That's almost like scripting. <laughs> <laughs> Not exactly, but yeah. So what was the what was the hardest part about working on the annihilation mission stuff? I'm trying to think about it. I think it was just like I think I did spend a lot of time on it, but you know, there's still a lot of enemies and just making sure like everything flows correctly. Um, you know, I think a lot of the bugs were guys getting stuck in the crates, ratchet trying or in the spawners, ratchet running in the spawners. Um, all these weird combinatorial things of like when you have these hazards and this thing with these enemies, their AI starts behaving weird. Like lots and lots of like enemies walking on top of the hazards looking really weird and all that kind of stuff. Like there's just so many different components that it was just sort of hard to manage and get all the bugs right with the infinite com combinations that we could configure. How big an issue was frame rate for you guys? Um, Did that come up too I often think... or did you guys actually do all right with that? The crowd was a frame rate problem. Yeah, so the, the crowd was a frame rate problem, and I think they just got rid of it for that reason. Well, the crowd's still there. It's just like way lower poly, f way fewer bones than it was. Yeah, yeah, they're all billboarded, animated billboard guys. Um, but yeah, it was the frame rate wasn't a much bigger problem here than it was everywhere else. I mean, it, when at the end we when we sort of did the frame rate pass on everything, I think the arenas were as big an issue as the other levels we had to deal with. God, I'm not even going to get to the boss. I have no ammunition. <laughs> I guess maybe you got to come back when you got more weapons. Yeah. Which is unfortunate. Yeah. I don't know what, what else you got. What else you got to say about this move? What? I'm trying to think. It's 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 weird trying to remember this kind of stuff. But I think for the most part, it was it wasn't too bad. It was just sort of you know getting the right feel of stuff. Um, I'm trying to think of the the worst bugs, and most of them were like things escaping levels. I mean, I I ran into all the same bugs that Max ran into. So I ran into like the golden shower. I ran into enemies escaping. Wait, the golden shower. Right. What's the golden shower? <laughs> the golden shower. So the one thing we do in the arenas is that we just recycle enemy. There's no like dynamic memory allocation, uh, or there's not much dynamic memory allocation in in Ratchet and Clank uh, the way we program it back then. So we just have like these giant pools of enemies. Um, scattered like or set outside the level that we sort of warp in. Oh, really? I didn't. I wasn't aware of that. So when they die, they don't die. They just teleport away. Exactly. They just teleport away. And oh, interesting. when you start recycling things, um, a lot of the time people get stuck in the dead state, um, and they'll just be dead every frame and spawning bolts every frame. And so they'll be just outside of the arena, like 20 or 30 guys spawning, you know, 20 bolts every time. And as time goes on, it just sort of overwhelms you until the screen is like completely filled with bolts and crashes. <laughs> and we called it the golden shower because the bolts were, were yep. gold uh, and because we're you know disgusting <laughs> uh, yeah, it looks what like do you think should I, get the, should I get the hydra it looks like you're not going to get that challenge done yeah I, mean, I'm gonna, I, mean, you I think you need you more ammo get. for that alright uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just do this platforming one and we can, we can keep talking yeah I mean the other like the other nice things about like you know, being new to all this stuff and like implementing like things like the cameras that follow you around. There's just like so many little touches that are just a load of fun to work on, even though, you know, they're not really core to the game. Like I remember the amount of time that Jared and I spent on that spinner trying or that spinner thing of just making it spin really quick, but end up on the result that we want. Um, Cause obviously we're supposed to make you feel like it's random, but it's not. Um, <laughs> Wait, what? It's configured in the levels. Oh, oh what? Don't look not behind random. the curtain. Pay no attention. Sorry. Yeah, so that's just all configured, and, you know, we just want to make it look random. So, you know, we we sort of, like, choose what the result is, choose a random amount of time to spin, go back from that, and just calculate the rest out. 
and that kind of stuff. But it's just, you know, like, all these little touches have such a huge impact on the game in the end. So, but, like, when you sort of go into these meetings and discuss, like, oh, I'm going to spend two days on cameras that follow you poorly, it just sounds kind of mental. <laughs> So yeah. did, did you do any? You did some stuff on the on these little obstacle course challenges, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, by the end of it, like everyone was doing little stuff on everything. Um, but yeah, Jared and I sort of shared oh, this shit, level. Oh shit, the ninjas are focused. here. Yep. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. You. Oh yeah, no, so, and we just sort of you know shared shared whatever, and I think, yeah, I, I I had you know a decent amount of like bug fixing and like small implementation tax tasks on this, but for the most part, Eric, Jared sort of drove it forward. I mean, this. I mean, these are interesting in themselves because they're basically built out of building blocks, which is, yep. I mean, what it is is. It, I mean, there's a lot that goes into that, making sure that they all fit together and and do things properly. Exactly, and and especially the you know we we sort of have this create this idea of update distance, and so things only update in like a certain distance around Ratchet, and everything else is just sort of not updated to save save on frame rate. But all these puzzles are like these synchronized patterns that you need to get right. And so it's like you kind of need it to update in the whole level, but we don't want to run the whole level at the same time. So Jared had to have like all these interesting synchronism mechanisms where, you know, one thing that was the head of the pattern would drive the whole thing forward so that everything would stay in sync. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we're we're done for now with Annihilation Nation. Oh, cool. And, all right. Uh, we're, we're off to Tyrannosis. So uh, I guess that's it. All right. So uh, for Rash and Clank. Uh, up your arsenal developer commentary i am tony garcia and i'm mike stout and t today we've got uh, our guest moo you yeah and we'll yeah, see you next time